We're talking to Dr. Al Hadid, the former uh, chairperson of the African Studies Department at uh, Tennessee State University. And of course, the topic is Islam and the African American experience. And Dr. Al Hadid is giving us some information in reference to Islam and the impact that this religion has had upon uh, peoples all over the world. Of course, go on, on Dr. Elodie, you can pick yeah. up at that point. Yeah, we briefly talked about the fifth pillar, which was the pilgrimage to Mecca, and in terms of how the experience that Malcolm X had. Let's uh, go right into Africa, yeah. in terms of how Islam spread through Africa. The first thing is that there's a myth out here that mm -hmm. Islam spread through Africa uh, by the sword. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not, in fact, you know, the case. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I want to focus primarily on West Africa. In West Africa, there were some very powerful empires. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there were three. Uh, one was the Mali Empire, mm -hmm. the, um, the Ghana Empire, and the Songhai Empire. And so Islam went into Africa during the heydays and the height of those mm -hmm. uh, last latter two empires, the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire. Mm -hmm. And then from there, it went into uh, Spain. Uh, where it established the Moorish Empire, which lasted from 711 to 1492, which is roughly the time that Columbus mm -hmm. left Spain and went out to so-called discover, mm -hmm. you know, the New World. Islam in Africa did a number of things. Uh, in, in, in brief, it did much of the things that it did in, in Arabia. That is, it went uh, to unite people across tribal differences. It established um, uh, another uh, uh, alphabet by which the African culture could be uh, written. I'm not suggesting that there were no alphabets mm -hmm. in Africa. Certainly there were alphabets in West Africa. And of course, we know about the hieroglyphics that were in Egypt. So, but it went in and it established uh, libraries and it connected mm -hmm. Africa with the rest of the world through trade. Uh, one of the most lucrative trade was the uh, trade in gold and mm -hmm. salt. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the technology that existed in the Muslim world was then imported into mm -hmm. West Africa. Well, as these empires developed and they had uh, various kings mm -hmm. and technology, of course, uh, around 1444, that's mm -hmm. the point at which the Portuguese and the Spanish okay. started mm -hmm. going into Africa mm -hmm. and engaged in the um, transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Well, that trade developed in such a, uh, you know, vicious way, uh -huh. and, and that dispersed Africans throughout mm -hmm. the, uh, the so-called New World. Mm -hmm. In, in South America, in the Caribbean, in North America. Uh, in terms of the percentage of Muslims that were captured and brought over here, uh, historians are not agreed on that actual percentage. I guess the, the low estimate would be about 20% of the mm -hmm. captives from West Africa. When we say West Africa, we're talking primarily the area around Morocco, mm -hmm. uh, Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, mm -hmm. et cetera, and which, what is called the Guinea yeah. Coast. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, if, if we say about 20 percent, and some say as high as 40 to 50 percent, mm -hmm. and the others who were not Muslims were practitioners of traditional mm -hmm. African religion. Uh, when they brought them over here, one of the first things that they tried to do was to stamp out uh, mm -hmm. Islam uh, mm -hmm. from among them because they knew that if they maintained this particular religion, then they would always be in a state of rebellion mm -hmm. against the plantation and the system of, of enslavement. Uh, proof of which is before they came over mm -hmm. here, you know, they, the uh, Europeans were engaged in the Crusades mm -hmm. and the Inquisitions, and there was very difficult fighting against them. And as mm -hmm. I've said earlier, the Africans from North Africa went into Spain mm -hmm. and occupied Spain for about mm -hmm. 700 yeah. years. So they were very much aware of the uh, militancy okay. uh, that, that mm -hmm. they knew that Islam was a force to be reckoned with mm -hmm. because uh, at that point, you know, Europe was pretty much held at bay. And it wasn't um, brought out of this uh, landlocked situation until after the end of the First World War with the fall of the Ottoman Empire. But getting back on this side of the Atlantic, so they said made sure that they stamped out, you know, Islam. So, in fact, they were fairly successful in doing this for a period of time. And then let's go forward to uh, the latter part of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. At that point, Islam started to emerge again. And as we go into the 20th century, it came out in the form of the uh, Moorish Science Temple with mm -hmm. Noble Drew Ali around 1916. And of course, that was Marcus Garvey that we talked about mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Marcus Garvey had been taught by Dusay Muhammad, who was a Muslim from uh, Egypt. Mm -hmm. And so even though he was not a Muslim uh, per se, uh, he more or less tried to bring his followers mm -hmm. to 
the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. But that Islamic influence was there because Duse Muhammad was one of his mentors. So if you look at a combination of what he learned from Duse Muhammad and also the presence of the Moorish science mm -hmm. inside of America, so that started to develop. One thing about this particular approach to Islam, it differed quite significantly mm -hmm. from Islam as it appeared in the Arabian Peninsula and also Islam as it was practiced in West Africa. And that difference, I think, came about because of the existence of racism and white supremacy. Okay. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the uh, ideology or nationalistic theology of the Nation mm -hmm. of Islam suggested that maybe the white man was the devil okay. and the black mm -hmm. man was God. But that had nothing actually to do with true Islam. Mm -hmm. and that wasn't the way it was taught in West Africa, where mm -hmm. we came from, nor was that the way it was mm -hmm. revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, in mm -hmm. Arabia. But be that as it may, uh, that very strong nationalistic spirit mm -hmm. started to develop in our community. And it wasn't until Malcolm made mm -hmm. the pilgrimage in 1965 mm -hmm. that things started to revert back to the universal mm -hmm. and original conception of Islam. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that universal conception is existing in the African-American community mm -hmm. today. I think you can look at two directions that it went. One is that when Malcolm came back from Mecca, he started mm -hmm. to bring about the universal ideas of Islam. Mm -hmm. And then when uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad passed in 1975, his son, Imam Warahti Muhammad, who just recently mm -hmm. passed mm -hmm. uh, this uh, month, as a matter of fact, he passed on mm -hmm. the 9th. But he was very, very instrumental and converting most of the followers of his father to mm -hmm. Sunni or mainstream mm -hmm. Islam. And so that significantly increased the number of mainstream Muslims in mm -hmm. America. Another thing that significantly increased the number of mainstream Muslims was the fact that mm -hmm. immigration policies became more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And then you have more immigrant Muslims mm -hmm. coming from Pakistan, from Egypt and mm -hmm. Syria. So today I would say that the vast majority of African-American Muslims practice mm -hmm. true Islam the way it was revealed to our right. Prophet Muhammad, you know, in the mm -hmm. 7th century. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, we're getting ready for the uh, second commercial break. Yes, here, I sense that. that. You, yeah. you, and you, <laughs> <laughs> you sense that, yeah. Yes, sir. And, and, and of course, uh, you know, as, as normal, we hate to uh, interrupt you, no, but uh, no problem. of course, uh, you know, we have to take this break, and sure. after which we'll have uh, about 10 minutes okay. to come back, and we'll uh, be able to wrap this up. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be back with our audience following this very, very short uh, commercial break. <laughs> We're talking to Dr.